Grab your Bibles with me, if you would. We're going to go Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Um, as you turn there, uh, any questions from the session yesterday or any of the previous sessions or just general questions, or, um, and we got to do this really quick, or uh, any topics perhaps that, because I, I do take requests, I mean, I'm here to please, so any topics perhaps that you might like me to teach on, we're halfway, it's Wednesday, um, but maybe, maybe get to later this week. So any of that, and we got to do it quick. So otherwise, we're going, to get, we're going to get to work. So questions from the previous sessions, topics you might like covered? Anything at all? I mean, it is smoky in here, but I don't see any hands. So great, good. We're good? You're good? I'm good? We're good. Romans 8. Okay. Um, we're going to read the text, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to, we're going to get to work. Okay? Romans 8. Uh, I was telling the guys earlier today. Best book of the Bible, probably Romans. Best chapter in the Bible, probably Romans 8. Best section of the best chapter of the best book, 831 out through the end, out, out to 9 is amazing. So verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, even more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then you get a long list here. Tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, Paul writing, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, would that truth, would that truth just settle down into our souls this morning? God, that it would free us from fear, that it would give us confidence, that we would recognize the beauty that, that, that nothing separates us from your love, not because we are faithful, but because you are. Father, would you just drive rebar into our souls this morning with confidence that you finish what you start in us for our joy, for your glory. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. So, the Apostle Paul, verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? Now, these things are the things he just talked about earlier in verse 26 and onward. And here's essentially what he said. What he said is, is that God is going to take everything and work it out for our good. All of it is going to work itself out for our good. For the good of those who love Jesus Christ. That's Romans 8, 28. I promise you, that is written on a coffee cup, a t-shirt, a bookmark, probably... Uh, it's, it's probably in a vending machine within a, a nine iron of here. Like, like, like that verse is, gets so much run in the church, Romans 8, 28. And it's a misunderstood verse because the good that the Apostle Paul is talking about is not up to us to determine the good, but rather the good comes in verse 29 that we look more like Jesus. And so Paul just kind of drops that bomb on the church in Rome and by extension us saying God is going to take everything, sin, people, your sin, the sin against you, the, 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 the trials, the difficulties, he's going to take all of that and work it out for your good. And your good is, is that he's going to use the suffering and the trials and all the difficulty to chisel away at you, to make you look less like you and more like Jesus Christ. So God is for you in Christ and in the suffering, in the middle of all of it, he's going to shape you more into the image of his son. And you may not know this, but you need to. The more you look like Jesus, the more joy you have in your life. The more, the more you look like Christ, the more joy you have in your life. God loves you so much that he is going to take the difficulties in your life to chisel away at you so that you look more like Jesus, so that in looking more like Jesus, you give God more glory and you walk in more joy. Okay? So, that's, so, so then he says, 
verse 31. So what shall we say to that? And then he continues, if God is for us, and God is for us in Christ. Do you know that? That God is for us in Christ. If you are in Christ, God is for you. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, do you know what the Bible's answer is to who can be against us? The, the biblical answer is everyone. Everyone is against us. D do you know that? Like, like, you have to be very careful with how you read the life of Jesus. If you are reading the life of Jesus, that Jesus walks around, preaches truth, that offends everyone, and the result of that is everyone loves him, I, I just wonder, who do you think it is that's killing him at the end of his life? If you think that Jesus rolls through, um, you know, uh, ancient Palestine and just people are following him on Twitter and lighting him up on Instagram and can't wait to be homies with him, I don't know what you do with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The, the, the reality is, is that we follow a man who dies utterly alone on a Roman cross. Everyone abandoned him. His disciples are not there cheering him on. There's a, there's a couple of women, one of them his mother, kind of watching from a distance. But for the most part, he is abandoned by everyone. So the, so the biblical answer, at least on, from one angle, the biblical answer is, if God is for you in Jesus Christ, if you follow Jesus, who can be against you? You're about to see in Romans 8 that the, the, the biblical answer is, dang near everything is going to be against you. But that's not the logic, because it's not the logic of um, count the numbers of people who are for you, which is God, and then count the, the quantity of all of the things are, that are against you. And as long as the quantity of God, being one, um, outweighs the quantity of all the other things. Like, that's bad math. In other words, what Paul is actually saying is, it's not going to come down to the quantity of the entities of things that are for you and against you. Rather, it is going to come down to the gravity of the thing that is for you versus the things that are against you. Do you understand what I'm saying here? What I mean by that is, is that God is so big and, and has so much gravity and weight and glory, which glory actually could be, could be considered weightiness to him, importance, preeminence, superiority, that even though there is only one in your corner God, when we're speaking in these terms, and, and the devil and the demonic realm and the kingdom of darkness and your sin and all of that is all of that is against you and a world living under subjection to the devil and following after the devil will be against Christians. All of that, combine all of it, and it is like, it's like a, a little ping pong ball compared to the Pacific Ocean, which is the weight and the gravity of God. So Paul is not saying that if God is for you, no one is against you. He, you're going to see that in a second. What he's saying is, is that when God is for you, and he is the most important and most superior and most weighty and most glorious and most powerful, when he's for you, it doesn't really matter who's against you because of the one who is for you. Do you understand that? So no one does. Okay, well, hopefully you'll understand as we continue. Then Paul continues and, and wants to anchor the fact that God is for you. He wants to remind you that God is for you. And here's how he does it. Verse 32. He, that's God, who did not spare his own son, that'd be Jesus, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So you can be confident that God who is for you, even in the face of everyone else being against you, that God will provide for you in the midst of all of the opposition because, and the way you're reminded of this, is you have to ask yourself, what has God done to demonstrate that he is for me? And the answer to that is, what he's done to demonstrate that he is for me is he put forth Jesus Christ. The second member of the Trinity, his beloved son, his most prized possession, if we can think of it in those terms. If God is willing to give up Jesus in order to be for you, then do you really think that he will leave you alone in the difficulty and in the opposition that you're in? Romans 8.31 is a verse that will just change your life. It will just change your life. 
Because there you sit in the middle of depression, anxiety, suffering, difficulty, divorced parents, bullying at school, uncertainty, sickness, all of that. There you sit in that. And what you're asking God to do in that is, God, don't leave me here. God, God, heal me. God, work this out for your glory. God, help me. And God is saying, look, this is the demonstration of my love for you. My son was wrung out on a cross so that I could make you my son or my daughter. Do you think that if I will give up my son in order to purchase you as my daughter, that I will now leave you alone in the midst of your loneliness or your anxiety or your sickness or your whatever? And the logic there is, of course he won't. It's kind of like, it's kind of like um, I give you a million dollars, which I don't have, by the way. But I give you a million dollars. I'm like, hey, here's a million bucks. You're welcome. And then you catch me later on that day and, you know, the, you haven't cashed the check yet and, and you need, you know, you're, you're 25 cents short on, on a milkshake. And, and you're afraid, like I just gave you a million bucks. I walk by, my, my jeans are just, are just rattling, just, just, just cling, cling, clinging with, with all this change in my pocket. You need 25 cents. You're like, man, I'd love to ask Alex for a quarter. I really need a quarter, but I'm just not sure he'd give it to me. I would just remind you, I just gave you a million dollars. You don't think I won't, I won't throw you a quarter? Like, that's, that's offensive to me, actually. It's insulting to my grace that you would do that. And yet, that's often what we do with God. He puts forth Jesus, and we're back here going, hey, I don't know. I mean, I could go to him and ask him for a quarter. You have to realize that even though the thing you're going through is monumentally significant in your life, it is not as significant as the putting forth of the second member of the Trinity to come into the world, take on flesh, die on a cross, bear the wrath of God in your place, rise from the dead three days later, ascend to the right hand of the Father where he is seated, waiting to return to bring you to himself, to the place that he has created for you in heaven. So that's the reality that we're sitting in and some of us yet still wonder and doubt, but God, do you see me in the middle of this? And that's where Paul goes next. Verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who can bring charges? That's legal terms. Who can bring charges against God's elect? The elect there would be the chosen or the church. It's just another way of saying believers. Who can bring? Now what Paul's going to do, you'll notice this. He's going to ask a bunch of questions and then he's going to answer them for you. So here's the first question. Who shall bring any charge, bring legal charges against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Do you understand what's happening there? What's happening there is, is that there are many who want to bring charges against you. The devil in Revelation 12 is referred to as the accuser of the brethren. He wants to bring charges. Other people might want to bring charges. At times, you may even want to bring charges. Charges of condemnation, charges of you're not worthy, charges of, of look what you did, charges of let's pull the resume here, let's, let's remind ourselves of how, th those kind of charges. And Paul says, who shall bring any charges? Now again, it's kind of like who's against us. Well, lots of people are against us. And lots of people want to bring charges. So he's not saying that no one will bring the charges. He's simply saying that the, that the accomplishments of God in Christ, it's God who justifies. So the reason that no one can bring charges against you and have them stick is because God has made you, has declared you righteous. Do you understand that? In other words, if God is superior again, the most important being in the universe again, and God says there's no condemnation for you, you are righteous, then all kinds of people can bring all kinds of charges all they want, but none of them stick because the judge of all the universe has said, not guilty. Drop the gavel. It's over. So who will bring charges? Lots of people. Will any of them stick? No. Why? Because God has justified or declared you to be righteous. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. So let's ask ourselves this question. Who can condemn you? 
The charges can't even be brought because God has made you justified, but Paul just continues down the line of logic. Who can condemn you? Answer, lots of people will try. None of them can. Do you know why? What does he say next? Why can't anyone condemn you? Like, uh, just help me. It's in the Bible. Why can't anyone condemn you? Like, read the next phrase. Who is to condemn? And then where's Paul's logic? What does he do? Okay, so somebody down here just said it. Only say it louder. You were right. Yeah, Christ Jesus is the one who died. Now let's say, okay, so the logic goes like this. Who can condemn you? No one. Lots of people will try. Why can't they? Paul says, because what? Because Jesus died. Now let's ask ourselves, why did Jesus die? This isn't hard. Like, it, it's, you know, it, it's not hard. Why did, why did Jesus die? For our sins. Yeah, he didn't die for his sin. I I could have made that multiple choice. I'm going to maybe do that in the future to help you guys out. So I I will. I'll make a multiple choice. Okay. Why did Jesus die? A, for his sin, or B, for ours? B. Yes. Man, like, I could stop preaching right now, but I'm not. So he died. He died for our sin, not his. Now, when he died for our sin, do you know what happens then to the subsequent condemnation that you were rightly under for your sin? So so you deserve to be condemned for your sin. The wages of sin is death. You deserve to be condemned. You should be condemned. Except for the fact that God puts all of your condemnation onto Jesus and Jesus dies. And what that means is, is that the charges of guilty, the charges of condemnation that are against you die once Jesus comes out of the grave. What that means is, is that, so there's like a legal term called double jeopardy. And double jeopardy means that you cannot be condemned for the same crime twice. You cannot be condemned for the same crime twice. So we could certainly, if we wanted to, make a list of all of your crimes. And we can do that. Jesus knows the list of all of your crimes. Jesus takes the list of all of your crimes. He places them onto himself. God the Father pours out the wrath for your crimes onto Jesus. The crimes are paid for. The condemnation taken care of. No one can condemn you because Jesus died. More than that, because he is raised. And what that means is, is that while people may try to condemn you, while the devil may try to condemn you, while you may try to condemn you, none of those charges of condemnation stick because for them to stick would require double jeopardy. It would mean that Jesus Christ bore your punishment for your sin. And it would also mean then that you must bear your punishment for your sin. And God is a good and just judge and he does not punish the same sins twice your sin is either punished on Jesus on the cross if you are in him or your sin will be punished on you in hell for all of eternity but if you are in Christ no one brings condemnation do you understand that it's really important Paul continues Not only has Jesus Christ died, more than that has been raised, but he sits at the right hand of God. And he indeed is interceding. That that would be a present activity. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father and interceding for us. So this is where kind of the idea from Revelation of the devil being the accuser of the brethren, the brethren there being believers, kind of comes into play. Because there's a very real sense in which God the Father sits on the throne, the Son of God sits at his right hand, and the Son of God makes intercession for those who have placed their faith into Jesus. And, And so the logic is no one condemns you because Jesus died more than that he's been raised and even more than that he's currently seated at the right hand of the father and interceding for you hearing your prayers and making them right and handing them to his father more than that the accuser of the brethren if the devil if he were to try to come into heaven be like God listen I mean Alex down there he's at Forest Springs this week we know this he he said that he would never do that again, and he did it. He said he wouldn't get angry anymore, and he has. Whatever those accusations are, if the devil were to to get audience with God in the throne room of heaven, all God has to do is, is, is when the devil comes in, is look to his right hand at his son and say, son, would you like to say anything about that? 
in which case the son, should he decide to, can stand up, show some nail-printed hands and feet, so show a, a brow that bears the scars of thorns and a back that has been flogged, um, and demonstrate to the devil that Alex's sins have been paid for. That, that Jesus Christ is my defense attorney who sits at the right hand of the Father, who has paid my wages of sin, who has died in my place, and therefore no no one, Alex, the world, the devil himself, can bring charges that will hold up because the, the evidence in the courtroom is in the form of a person who died in my place and has declared me righteous. But we're not even done. This is classic Paul. Like, we're not even done. So then he asks the question, okay, so... So if God's for you, who can be against you? Well, a lot of people, but, but none of them more important than God. Therefore, they can all be against you if they want to. Okay, well, well then who can, who can um, bring, bring charges? Well, lots of people try to bring charges, but none of them can. Okay, well, 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 how do we know that none of those charges will bring condemnation? Well, lots of people will try to condemn, but none of them will because Jesus Christ died. More than that has been raised. More than that is seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay, so, so, so clearly then, to, to come against me, you have to go through God. In order to bring charges against me, you have to go through God. In order to condemn me, you have to go through God. And none of that's going to happen. And so then the question becomes, okay, well, if that's all locked up and Alex is locked up, no one can come against him, no one can condemn him, no one can bring charges, okay, then how, then, then, then maybe this, maybe, maybe we can get Alex out from under the love of God, maybe we can pull Alex away from God, if we can, obviously God here is our problem, because he's bigger than us, so we can't, we, we, we can't come against Alex, and, and, he's and God has justified Alex, declared him righteous, so as long as Alex is nearby God, we can't get to Alex, so here's what we'll do, we'll pull him away, and Paul goes, not so fast, it's a good idea, but not so fast. So Paul goes there, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In other words, hey, if we're going to get Alex, we've got to get him away from Jesus, so let's get him away from Jesus. So Paul goes, oh, you want to play that game? Let's do it. Who shall separate us, believers, from the love of Christ? And he's going to give you a long list. Shall tribulation? No. Or distress? No. Or persecution? No. Or famine? No. How about nakedness? No. Or danger? No. Or sword? And then Paul interrupts himself, and he's going to go quote the Old Testament. And he interrupts himself because he doesn't want you thinking that if God loves you, you will never experience nakedness, famine, persecution, trials, and swords. Now, unfortunately, especially in the United States of America, we have created a gospel that says that once you believe in Jesus, everything's going to go cool for you. And if it's not, it's because you don't actually know Jesus. The Bible says the exact opposite. The Bible says that once you know Jesus, things may very well go horribly bad for you. And that's why Paul interrupts himself and he says, listen, I don't want to be misunderstood here. What shall separate us from Christ? Tribulation? No. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Danger? No. Sword? No. But not because you will never face those things, which is where he quotes the Old Testament. For your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded like sheep to be slaughtered. Do you know that every day for the last 2,000 years of redemptive history, men and women have had their blood spilled because they believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know that? This is the reality of, the, of our history. Our lineage as believers. The gospel coming to you through a preacher has come to you through a river of the blood of the martyrs. Men and women have historically died, lots of them, every day for the message of the gospel. And in their dying, no one separated them from the love of God in Christ. 
you have to ask yourself, don't you? What makes Jesus look more beautiful? When you believe in him and everything in your life goes awesome, and since everything in your life is awesome, you keep on believing in him. Or when you believe in him and your world falls apart, and in its falling apart, you continue trusting in him. You see, this prosperity gospel garbage that's been taught in America and now given all over the world, that when you believe in God, he makes you healthy, he makes you wealthy, he gives you all the stuff you want. Here's the problem with that. The problem with that is, is that's all that the unbelieving world wants anyway. You don't need a new heart to want a nice car. You don't need a new heart to, to want to be healthy. You don't need a new heart to want to prosper in all of that. But when you don't prosper and the whole world falls apart and you're burned at the stake while singing praises to your king, well, that makes Jesus Christ look precious to a lost and dying world. Paul is saying nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ, although everything will try. Everything will try. He continues, no, verse 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present now, nor things to come then, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else, in all of creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's the question then. What can separate you from the love of God in Christ? This is an appropriate time for you to say nothing. So let's try this again. What can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ? Nothing, nothing can. Now, it is as important to me right now and to the biblical text for you to answer that question properly, and you've just done that by saying nothing, but it is equally important that you understand why that is. I'm not interested in your ability to say nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ if you don't understand why that is. So stick with me for one moment. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates the world, and it's good. In Genesis chapter 2, God creates man and woman in his own image, and they are good. And in Genesis chapter 3, they screw the whole thing up by sinning. God, after they sin, comes down in the garden, and he's looking for Adam and Eve, and he cannot find them because they are hiding. Now, he knew where they were, but he's going to play along. They pop out of the bushes. God says, why were you hiding? They say, because we were naked, Adam, because we're naked. God said, who told you we were naked, that you were naked? Adam proceeds to blame his wife, blame God. Eve proceeds to blame the serpent, and everything breaks. Everything breaks. The entire world breaks, shatters, sin infects everything. God comes to Adam and Eve after this and he, ex he, he explains to them what the repercussions, what the collateral damage for their sin is going to be. And then he says something to the serpent who lied to the woman. And this is what he says. Through your line will come a seed, a man, who will end up getting himself a bruised heel but he will crush your head. Theologians have noted and called that the proto-evangelion. What that means is it is the first proclamation of the gospel. See, you and I would have thought that the gospel didn't show up till Matthew. It's not true. The good news of God setting right in the world all that has gone wrong, Genesis chapter 3. So, then you start tracing out the line of the woman. And guess what happens? A man named Cain is born. And he kills his brother Abel. And you keep on tracing out the ark. And while you heard that God would win the battle, it certainly does not appear that way. And on and on you trace through the Old Testament as all of the seed of the woman seem to lose to the serpent and believe his lies rather than to crush his head. 
you may not know this, but as the Old Testament ends, there's a page right there. It's called the New Testament. And then you turn the page and you end up in Matthew chapter 1. There's 400 years of silence in between the time that the last prophet of God spoke in the Old Testament and, and Jesus shows up on the scene in the New Testament. The Old Testament is dark. And it is dark because the seed of the woman cannot overcome the lies of the serpent. Do you know why um, some of the Gospels be begin with a genealogy? The genealogy is the part you always skip. Adam gave birth to so-and-so and so-and-so to so-and-so, and you skip that part. Do you know why they begin that way? Because it is a reminder that God keeps his promises. That God made a promise in the presence of Adam that someone would come and fix all of it. And that man is introduced to us in Matthew chapter 1 as God's son, a king come in the flesh, born in a manger named Jesus. On the cross... Jesus is going to crush the head of the serpent. And on the cross, Jesus is going to get himself quite a bruise on his heel. Before he gets there in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 10, he says, My sheep, they hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give to them eternal life. No one takes them out of my hand because my Father who gave them to me is greater than all. Jesus dies on the cross and it seems like he has lost all of his sheep only to rise from the dead three days later and go find the handful of his sheep that, that are in fact his sheep. He tells those sheep that he is going to leave. And he tells those sheep to go into all the world and tell everyone about him. And then he says to those sheep, I will come back. One of those sheep's name is John. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he also wrote an interesting and rather confusing book called Revelation in Revelation chapter 1, John is brought up into the heavens and he is given a view. I really need you to stick with me here, okay? He is given a, a picture, a vision of the Son of Man, which is a, a, a prophecy from Daniel chapter 7 about a king whose rule and reign will never end. And that Son of Man, that's Jesus. He's given a vision of Jesus. Jesus is looking rather interesting at this time. He has fire coming out of his eyes. His hair is bright white. He's dressed in a robe. He has a golden sash across his chest. And he has feet made of burnished bronze as though refined by fire. Do you know why that's significant? It's significant because when you step on a venomous snake barefoot, you might get the back of those fangs running into the heel of your foot. But when you step on the head of a snake with bronze boots on, your heel obliterates the head of the serpent. Here's my problem. My problem is, is that many of you fancy yourself that little iguana. You pop up out of the sand. The serpent takes notice. You sit still when you need to sit still. You run fast when you need to run fast. He grabs you. You escape. You're cunning. You're quick. You juke him. I just want you to know that like, that was like the, that was like the lot, like that iguana won the lottery, right? Like they don't show you all the ones that get eaten. Like dang near all of them get eaten. They just show you that one to make you feel good. But you think that that's who you are. You think, you think that, 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 that in order to ensure that you don't get separated from the love of Jesus Christ, you got to juke some dudes. 
You think you've got to throw some stiff arms. You think you've got to sit still when you should sit still and run when you need to run. In other words, you think it's on you. The Bible does not portray or teach anywhere that it ultimately is on you. The entire thrust of Romans 8 and the reason no one can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ is, listen to me, not because you are awesome, but because he is. The picture that the Bible gives you is here you are the little lizard. Jesus comes by, he picks you up and he says, you're mine. I will hold you, I will keep you, I won't let go of you. And then Jesus straps on his bronze boots and starts walking across the beach and just starts crushing some fools. All the serpents to try to, he's just squashing them. I mean, he is treading on their heads over, he's, he's, making, he's making gravy out of their skulls. That's what he's doing. And all of them try to get you. And you get scared and even try to run off. And he's like, no, no, you're mine. Get over here. I won't let you go. Nothing will separate you from the love of my Father that has been manifest in me. I will hold you. I will keep you. I won't let go of you. Now listen, to me that does not mean you're not going to die you will and the good news of Psalm 23 is that we have a good shepherd who walks us through the valley of the shadow of death and sees us out the other side into the green pastures of heaven. Do you know why Jesus Christ is sufficient to lead you even through the valley of the shadow of death? Because he's been there before and because he came out the other side alive. So there is beautiful truth for you and me that in the midst of suffering and in the midst of trials and in the midst of difficulty and famine, nakedness, danger, sword, angels, rulers, powers, authorities, all of it, that in all of it that will come at you, there is one who will hold you and keep you and see you through. I tell you that because your storm is coming. Some of you, you've seen some storms, 15, 16, 17, 14, whatever age you are, you've already seen some. Maybe you are there. But for all of us, it's coming. Life is terribly difficult. You need to know that. But Jesus is unspeakably loving and sufficient to carry you through. He will hold you he will keep you. He will not let you go. And he will see you safely to the other side. Father, we praise you that this is who you are. God, we thank you that it is not up to us to keep ourselves in your love. Because, Father, if we're honest, and I don't even know that we would be, but if we're honest, we do a poor job of loving you. God, there are moments in our lives where love for you is completely absent and love for ourselves and sin and death and hell and all of it is very present. And yet in all of that, you are still present, holding us, keeping us, and not letting us go. Father, would there be confidence in this room in your goodness and your grace that you will finish what you started in us? We pray these things in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen.